Cheater! Cheater! On this week's episode of 5 Minute Physiology, we talk about whether or not using things like straps, belts, and swinging do in fact make you... Cheater! Are these things really cheating? Well, your answer is yes. Of course they are. But that's the point. What I want to talk about today is not necessarily the fact that these things are cheating or not, because they are, depending on how you want to define cheating. The point is, anytime you make any change in your technique, whether that be with the use of some sort of additional equipment, or say you go to a sumo stance when you're deadlift, is that cheating? Of course it is. What about if you go to a narrow width or, or a wider width uh, with your bench? Whether or not you split with your jerk or squat straight down. Any change you make in technique or equipment is going to change the movement. Therefore, some would define it as cheating. And the only reason you typically change things is to either make the exercise more difficult or easier. All right, so for some reason, we have it in our head that if we make an exercise partially easier, it is therefore somehow cheating. All right, so what I'm really saying is calling things like straps, belts, uh, wraps, braces, um, using momentum or swinging, Calling that cheating shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what's actually happening. Right, Low-level coaches make decisions like, this is good, this is bad. High-level coaches make things like, well, this is the good aspect of this, and this is the bad aspect of this. This is the good aspect of this, and this is the bad aspect of that. Right? What I'm really talking about here is this. Can you answer one fundamental question of, Why? Why are you using the strap? That's what's going to tell you if it's cheating or not. Why are you swinging? That's what's going to tell you if it's cheating or not. So I want to go through just a few examples so I can highlight the point because I, I think it shows a, a bigger picture of how we should start thinking about exercise nutrition as well. All right, so let's walk through straps for one second. And I'll just give a couple of examples here. So you, yes, yes I mean you, you at home watching this. I want you to think of off the top of your head two reasons why, or two situations in which using a strap, uh, and we'll use uh, the video examples, say during a deadlift, when would using a strap actually be a good thing? Right, I'll give you a second. Come up with two different scenarios. Then if you've done that, I want you to come up with two scenarios that would make it cheating or would make it a bad decision. Okay, hopefully you're done by now. I'm just going to come up with these a couple off the top of my head. So say, for example, we're doing a deadlift today. And just before we got to our deadlift, we did a bunch of pull-ups. And we smoked our grip. Well, if we decide to go deadlift and our grip is so smoked that we can't pick up anything off the floor without losing it to our hands, we'll never sufficiently challenge our low back, glutes, or hamstrings, or whatever muscle group or movement we were trying to attack with the deadlift. So we won't actually be getting the benefit of the movement because we sacrificed it with the previous movement. So in that particular case, I would say using a strap is cheating, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to eliminate the limitations so we can actually train what we're looking for. So in that case, I would say strap would be a great idea. Or inverse, what if you haven't done any pull-ups, but you know pull-ups are your major weakness, or maybe rather the grip aspect of your pull-ups is your major weakness. So when you do your deadlifts, you maybe say, Look, I'm going to save my grip on my deadlift because I really have to have my grip perfect when I do my, my pull-ups today because my pull-ups are more important to me today than my deadlift. If the deadlift was more important that day, then you should probably say, no, I'm not going to use my straps. That's a bad thing right? because I'm focused on maximizing my deadlift. Right? So on that, on that note, a similar idea, if you're trying to use the deadlift to synergistically work your glutes, hamstrings, and your grip strength, well then of course using your strap takes away the work of the grip, so it's kind of defeating the purpose. 
Right? And we could come up with hundreds of different scenarios that could put you in this category, that category, but I think you're getting the point. You really need to identify, when I use something like a strap, what is it taking away? What is it giving me? So in the one example of deadlift, what it did is it took away the difficulty of the grip. And if you're someone like me, for example, who say I can deadlift, and I'll just make up an easy number, 800 pounds, right? If I can deadlift 800 pounds, when I put straps on, say I can deadlift 1,000 pounds, that would mean when I don't use the straps and I'm only deadlifting 800 pounds, I'm never actually really training my strength deficit of my back, my glutes, and my hamstrings because I'm never challenging them to their full capacity, which is actually the 1,000 pounds. So on one hand, you could say if you don't use the straps, you're cheating your glutes and hamstrings and low back. Right? So of course it's cheating. It just depends on why are we cheating. Now we could say the same thing for the belt. We could come up with a couple of different scenarios. Now some people say things like when you put the belt on because it allows you to push back into the belt, you can push back in a circular pattern here which, when, which can help you brace your spine so that your spinal column stays braced on all sides. Well some would say if you do that, the belt will actually work as your abs Therefore, your abs will shut off, so it's cheating, right? Well, depending on how you're using this damn thing, and we'll cover how to do this in a separate video, that could be true, or like some recent studies have shown, sometimes using a belt increases core activation. You heard that right. Sometimes when you put a belt on, you use your core even more. It comes down to if you understand the tool. So not only do you have to understand the pros and cons, you have to understand how to properly apply the tool. So don't blame the tool itself, blame the fact that you didn't use it correctly. The, really what I'm highlighting in all of these things is there are no such thing as bad or good exercises. There are only bad applications of exercises. So straps aren't bad for you, but using a strap at the wrong time could be bad for you. Same thing with swinging, and this is the last short example I'll cover. Right? If I swing, does that mean I take away from the use of the bicep in the, in the bicep curl example? Of course it does. There's no debate about that. But the question is, do you care? Why are you doing the bicep curl in the first place? Now I can come up with 100 scenarios in which it's a good thing to swing during a curl and 100 when it's a bad. You gotta figure out why you're doing it. If you haven't asked yourself that question in the first place, you aren't doing your job as a trainer or a coach. Right? One quick example. Say, for example, you're working with a 40-year-old uh, woman who hasn't exercised in 20 years and she's 35 pounds overweight. You might not really care what specific muscle group she's using. You have an intended target. You're trying to balance out the body by working a little bit of every muscle, but really you're just trying to get her moving. And so maybe the first week, two, three weeks, as long as she's staying in good positions with things like her cervical spine, her lumbar spine, her knees, if she's swinging a little bit, if she's squeezing her glutes and swinging, if that takes a little bit of load off the biceps and adds it to the glutes, who cares? You're trying to get her moving more. If, for example, maybe it's that same old lady and she's got some elbow issue and you're trying to specifically target the biceps to correct some elbow or shoulder issue, or maybe she's wanting specifically to increase the size of her bicep, then in that case I would say make sure to eliminate all swinging and momentum so that we can focus directly on the biceps. But that's not always what your desire is. All right. Another example of swinging. If I sit here in a dead stop and I don't use any momentum or any bouncing or swinging and I curl up as hard as I can, almost all of the force being applied to my hand into the barbell or dumbbell is coming from the biceps. However, if I were to give it a swing, okay, that would mean some of it's coming from the biceps, but some of it's coming from the tendon, which is the thing that connects your bicep to your actual bone, which makes your arm move. If you're trying to train the bicep muscle itself, perhaps you isolate. If you're trying to train them to work together so that we can coordinate more realistic athletic or real life movements, perhaps we don't care or we want to even encourage the swing. Right? Now, of course, there are risks associated with that, but there are risks associated with everything. You just have to identify them. Right? So to summarize all of that, in this week's 5-Minute Physiology, 
Are straps, belts, and, and swinging, and other tools cheating? Of course they are. But can you identify, number one, why are you doing the exercise? And things like, because I want to work my arms, it's not a good answer. Do you know specifically why? Can you give me a 15 minute explanation of why you picked that exact exercise with that exact stance, with that exact grip, with that exact equipment? If you can't, you don't know what you're doing enough to work with someone or yourself. Then once you've identified that, then can you tell me, okay, if I do use this implement or this alteration or, or this adaptation, what's, gonna, what's it going to enhance and what's it going to take away? What's my situation? What are my concerns? And when can I take advantage of that so that I can stay away from injury and reach my performance or outcome goals? That's it for this, this episode of 5-Minute Physiology. We'll see you next time when we will definitely be having 25-minute and 55-minute physiology versions of this. I'm sure I irritated some of you. or I'm going to get plenty of haters on this one, but that's okay. Hopefully some of you enjoyed it and I opened your eyes up a little bit. I appreciate the support and we'll see you next time on 5-Minute Fizz.